Hello. Hey, y'all. How are you guys doing? What's up, Lush? Nice of you to join. What's up, Casey? Hello to you. What's up, Wing Chun? How are you doing? Hey, Hope. Happy warm moon. What is that? <clears throat> April 8th is the solar eclipse. Oh. It goes through Montreal, I believe. Yeah. Maybe you might want to catch that. I'm nowhere near it. What's up, Side Duck? How's it going? What's up, Bigfoot? How are you doing? Hey, Claire. What's up, Rude Noise? How are you doing? Hey, Nikki. Glad you could join. What's up, Sunny Side Up? Good afternoon to you. Thinking of rejoining the Discord. Is it active? Ah, uh, not that active. <laughs> I think it's more active if I, I'm more active on it and I'm not that active on it, unfortunately. What's up, Malik? How's it going? Hey, Sal. <sighs> the eclipse goes right over you. Oh, are you going to catch it? Nikki, that'd be hella cool. You post fan art of posphemy. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Rude noise. You like the new vid? Thanks. I like it too. <clears throat> uh, your buddy's son pulled a shotgun on a woman stole her car and ran from the police and is now in prison <laughs> for what uh yeah well that does sound like he deserves it but lady coy how's it going Once you find the sketchbook. Sal, are you a artist? All right. Let's do this. Oh, you know what happened today? <laughs> okay. I got a package sent to my house. And I was like, wait, hmm, I didn't order anything. What is this? It's like, a, it's like this big. It's like a, yeah, this big of a package. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what it, what it is. I open it up and um, it, was, it had these two, uh, these two um, cans. I didn't know what those were, right? I looked it up. I was like, what is this? And it turns out, um, it's baby formula. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait, why did someone send me baby formula? I looked at the address and yeah, it was just like from the baby formula company. I forgot what it's called. Infamil or some something. I don't know. Yeah. And I was like, wait, why did they suddenly just out of nowhere send me freaking Baby formula. Am I going to drink it? Uh, no, I'm not going to drink it. Infanticide. So I looked it up and I was like, uh, and apparently that's, this is what happens. So these companies, they do just sometimes send you baby formula for people who they think are expecting. I'm not sure where they got the idea that I'm expecting a child. Probably because I have a baby face. Oh. oh yeah. They sent it to me. 
I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I can't drink it, right? It's for babies. Like, can I drink it? Is there going to be, is it going to cause issues? I don't know. I should drink it. It's for the baby possum. Gotcha. <laughs> Can adults drink baby formula? What's the... Probably, right? Must be all the courtesans. What's up, Bravehorn? It de-ages you? Oh my god. That would be hella cool. I'm thinking uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just give it to someone. Maybe I'll go to I'll go on Facebook Marketplace and uh, and put it up for zero dollars. See if anyone picks it up. It's probably expensive, right? Someone might want it. Drink it at the end of the stream. <laughs> yeah, so that happened, and then another thing happened today. I got an um, email from a sponsor. Like I get these all the time. I got an email today from a sponsor. And they're like, oh, we would like to work with you. Um, um, we, would want, we want uh, to work with you on um, a collaboration. We want you to make one video for us, okay, to uh, sell our product. And the product is a breast pump. The Breast Pump S1 Pro. Yeah. No, wait, wait. What a coincidence. What is going on? Did I go on some, like, Google list of expecting mothers? Imagine me advertising a breast pump on the main channel. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. The randomness. Advertisement. I do talk about boobs a lot. <clears throat> it's all the Bebe stuff I talk about? Do you think so? I don't talk about Bebe stuff that much. <clears throat> Is it good? The brand? Well, I can't tell you. I'm not advertising them. They need to pay me. They should have done that with my breast milk video. True. Oh, that would be a great advertisement for that video. <clears throat> there has been a lot of babies in the vid. Well, there are no bebes in the latest vid. It's about women who can't have bebes. All right. <clears throat> oh, a Linfamy brand breast pump. Holy shit. That would be so awesome. I'll sell it on my merch store. I wonder how many people would buy. That <laughs> sounds dirty. Gonna have my face on it on the breast pump. Oh yeah. Gonna go for a lot. Alright. Let's see how this works. Do do do. Alright, alright. Okay. I figured out the window situation. It's working out for me now. All right, ready? You fear for the placement of my face <laughs> on the pump? Yeah, what do you mean? It's just my face, right? With my mouth open like this. I'm sorry. Sorry for the visual. All right, let's do this. Wordle, come on. The 
sauce. No, no e saute. No sauna, sauna. No, no you. Sandy. Sandy. Oh, okay, okay. Sally? It's never a name. Must be something else. Saggy? <laughs> Boobs? <laughs> Why? Boobs are on my mind now. Sa Safety. But what if it is saggy? Savvy. Oh, both could work. Let's think of a word with both V and G. Vague. Vag. <laughs> What's going on? Value. V A G. Vig. Vig. There. Hmm, can I use more of the missing letters? Val. Value. Vag. Vague. Let's just do that. Ah, uh, no, no. S A. Not savvy or saggy. Saggy. Saw. Socky. Sally, Sal, Salky, Sulky, Salky, Salfi, Salby, Salky, Sag. Hmm. S A C K, Saki. Not a word, right? Safely. Hmm, salky, salty, salty, no T. Selfie, Sally, Sally, Sal Saki. Sab, Sah, Saf, Sal, Saw, Sazzy, Saxy, Saxophone. Huh! What is it? Sake? Sake? Sakely? <laughs> oh no, what is it? So. Saw. Saw. Sab. Saj. Sab. Saf. Saw. Saz. Sax. Sack. Sack. Oh man, what is it? Sazzy. Like jazzy? S A B. It's gotta be Sally, right? I, that's the only thing I can think of. But it's never a name, unless Sally is a word. That means something else. Oh, I want to try it, but I don't think I don't think it's I don't think it's right. Saf. Ugh. Ugh. I don't think it's right. It's the only thing, though. Oh, wait, really?
Does Sally mean something other than a name? No. Definition. <laughs> oh, it does. A sudden charge out of a besieged place. Oh, it's a good word. <clears throat> kind of a cop out a sally so like you s it's a sally he's they sallied out or they sallied from the castle they sallied out to harass the enemy okay hey learn something new every day All right, you guys ready? Let's do five minutes. Sally forth. Oh yeah, you sally forth. Sally. Sappy. Saggy. Um, hint. Give up. Why? Word. Plain. Air. Oh, air. Plain. Doctor. Fly. <clears throat> Cloud. High. Sky. Up. Jump. Glide. The <laughs> pump. Breast, snack, milk, squirt, um, <clears throat> hormone, okay, okay, chemical, oh, hello, plastic, about, uh, reaction. Drugs? Hmm. Imbalance. Drug. Science? Pharmacy. Ooh. Chemistry. Biological. Warfare. Dose. Explosion. Destruction. Chemical equation, math, um, cocktail, antibiotic, hmm, chemical, compound. Oh, oh my God! Good job, Nikki. Wow, what was that? Like two minutes? Insulin. Compound. So good. Someone remembers her chemistry. That's two minutes, 17 seconds. Okay, we're getting too strong for, for Samantha. Remember last time? We got it in the first try, baby. The first try. I think we're beating Samantha. That was 42. All right. You guys ready? I have this today. White chocolate fruits, eh? Let's see how you taste. <clears throat> what? It looks like a big thing, but look. Most of it was air. It's just this big. That's false advertisement. It 
It looks like bananas, but I know it's made of white chocolate. Yeah. Little pieces. Oh. It actually tastes like bananas. I guess I taste some white chocolate. Um, not a fan. Oh my god. I hate banana. Squishy? No, zero out of ten. No squish. Is that the baby formula? <laughs> yeah. I'm drinking baby formula at the end of the stream. How about that? Bring back Loodle. Ludo was fun. Oh yeah, forgot about it. When I say it tastes like bananas, do I mean crazy good? No, I mean bad. Boo. Oh, sorry guys, this is a three out of 10. Not a fan. Okay, well, I'm glad that it only came in. There's like one, two, three, four. There's like six pieces. <clears throat> All right. Are you all ready? Let's get into it. <laughs> All right, recap. <clears throat> what happened last week? So last week, um, our two couples, you remember they meet the Taoist priest. He's a patriot of the Song, okay? And he's the leader of some powerful sect. He also beheaded a traitor. Um, he becomes friends with the two men. Guo Xiaotian and Yang Tiaxin. Um, he names their future kids. Okay, they asked him to give their kids names, so he does it. Um, he names them um, Guo Jing and Yang Kang. Okay, and he, the Taoist priest, gives them two knives and engraves one of the names on each of the knife. The knives. Okay. Yeah, as a gift for the two kids, and he leaves. Um, the two sworn brothers, they decide on a vow. If their kids are both male or both female, then they would become sworn brothers or sworn sisters. Um, but if one is male and the other is female, then they would marry. And everyone's happy, okay? So that night, um, Bao Shi Ruo, he's, she's the wife of Yang Tiaxin, she finds an injured man on the ground. And she figures that he's one of the soldiers that came after the Taoist priest that day. Um, and she's way too kind for her own good. So she puts him in the barn and she nurses his wounds. Okay. Um, she also thinks he's, he looks kind of handsome. Um, the next day she goes to the barn, but he has already left. And she figures, oh well, no harm done. Um, months later, some soldiers come to arrest the two sworn brothers on the orders of the magistrate. Um, they refuse and they get into a huge fight. During the fight, Guo Xiaotan gets killed by this big brute of a man named Duan Tiandu. Um, he, he has a scar on his forehead and a birthmark on his face. Okay, I think we're meant to remember this guy. Yang Tiaxin saves Li Ping. Um, the, his sworn brother is his wife, um, but his own wife gets kidnapped in the chaos. Um, a group of soldiers grabs his wife, Bao Xi Ro, and they ride off. But as they're riding off, they run into a second group, much later, much further on, who saves her. Um, and it turns out that, coincidentally, the leader of that group is the guy that she saved months ago. Um, he says that he saw her husband die in battle, okay? So she gets super sad. Um, his, his name is Ye Yen Lie. 
So Yan Lie, he vows to avenge her husband by killing Duan Tian De, that big brutish guy with a scar on the forehead and the birthmark on his face. He's obviously very interested in her, um, and he takes her north to find a place to lay low for the time being, okay, as they plot their revenge. And that's it. How's that? <clears throat> All right. All right, we're on chapter one, part three. <laughs> So he says, uh, after that, I'm going to find out, find that bastard Duan Tiandu and kill him. Okay, this is Yen Lie. Bao Shi Ruo has a very tender and selfless personality. Oh, wait, let me switch the live screen. Rarely does she come up with ideas of her own. Besides, right now, she's all by herself in the world. Seeing that he has it all figured out, she could not help but be touched. She said, Mr. Yan, how, how will I ever be able to repay you? Oh, he knows how. Yan Lia confidently replied, Madam, this life of mine was saved by you. So even if I have to jump into boiling oil or be smashed into dust, I would serve you for the rest of my life. Bao Shi Ruo replied, I only hope that we can avenge my husband's death and kill that evil Duan Tian De as soon as possible so I can join him on the other side. When she thought about this, tears started to roll out of her eyes again. The two of them rode for the rest of the day and then stopped at a little hotel in Chang'an for the night. Yan Lie put the two down as a couple and got one room. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Did he? This guy, man. What are you going to do? What are you planning to do? Bao Shi Ruo could not help but feel that there was something wrong about this. So she did not utter a word during dinner as she secretly touched that dagger that Chu Chu Chi, that's the Taoist priest, gave her to make sure that, it's, that it was there. She made up her mind. If he gets the slightest bit of ideas, I would kill myself right there on the spot. <laughs> yeah, you could try to kill him first. And then kill yourself. Yeah, you try to kill him first. And if you can't, then you kill yourself. The first thought shouldn't be to kill your own self. Just my thoughts. Yan Lia instructed the floor manager to bring him two bundles of straws into the room. He waited until the floor manager left before locking the door up and laying out the straws on the floor. He lay down on the straws and covered himself with a felt blanket. He turned to Bao Shi Ruo. Good night, madame. And then he closed his eyes. Bao Shi Ruo's heart was beating a mile a minute. Remembering her dead husband, she felt all torn up inside. She blankly sat there for over an hour before finally sighing and blowing out the candle. Still clutching the dagger tightly, she climbed into the bed with her clothes on. When Bao Shi Ruo woke up the next day, Yan Lie had already packed and readied everything, not to mention instructing the floor manager to get some breakfast ready. Bao Shi Ruo was very thankful for his gentlemanly actions and let most of her guard down. By the time she ate breakfast, she noticed that it was a dish of chicken fried noodles, a dish of ham, a dish of sausages, a dish of smoked fish, and a small pot of deliciously smelling rice and stock gruel. 
She was raised in a moderately well-off family. Even after marrying into the Young family, she had always had a life of a normal farmer. Usually, breakfast for her was a couple of salted vegetables and half a salted egg. Other than New Year's and weddings, she had never eaten such delicacies, so she felt quite uncomfortable during all of breakfast. Once she finished eating, the floor manager came by with a bundle. By now, Yan Lia had left the room. Bao Shiro asked, What is this? The floor manager replied, Mister went out as soon as the sun rose and bought a change of clothing for madame. He told me to ask you to change into it. Once he finished, he put down the bundle and left. Bao Shiro opened the bundle and was shocked. It was a completely white morning dress made out of silver and with matching white socks, shoes, inner garments, and jacket, as well as matching scarf, bandanas, and other accessories. She thought, so hard for a young man like him to think of everything. When she changed into the clothing, the thought that Yan Lia bought these himself made her blush. She had left the house in a hurry in the middle of the night, so her clothing was not very neat to begin with. Then, after a whole night of misadventures, she was covered in dirt and sweat. Now that she had brushed up somewhat, her spirit picked up somewhat as well. When Yan Lia returned, she noticed he had changed into colorful and expensive attires as well. So this guy, yeah, who is this guy, guys? Who do you think? He seems like he's pretty rich and powerful. The two of them got on the way again. Sometimes one of them rode in front while the other one followed. Other times they rode side by side. The season of spring was in its full glory south of the Yang Si. Willows brushed people's shoulders on the road, flower fragrances filling the air and people's hearts, and plants were starting to sprout in the farms. In order to distract her thoughts and lessen her troubles, Yan Lia kept on talking to her about various random subjects. Bao Xi rules his father was an unaccomplished scholar in a little village. Her husband and his sworn brother were both straightforward and unrefined men, so she had never met someone as refined, gentlemanly, and knowledgeable as him. When they talked, she felt that every word, every sentence that he said, was greatly intelligent and thought-provoking. She could not help but secretly look at him in wonder. Oh no. However, they kept on heading north and getting further and further away from Lin An. Not only did he never once mention about revenge, he did not even bring up the subject of a proper burial for her husband. Finally, she could not keep it in any long uh, any more and asked, Mr. Yen, what are your plans regarding my husband's body? Yen Lia relied, relied, replied, it's not that I don't want to search for your husband's body and give him a proper burial, but I killed government officials when I rescued Madame, so right now it is very dangerous for me there. As soon as I show myself around Lin An, I would no doubt be killed by soldiers. Besides, right now the soldiers are all over the place, looking for Madame. After all, your husband did commit treason by killing officials. This is a huge crime. If his relatives are captured, men are executed, and women are made into prostitutes for the soldiers. Dying for me is no big deal, but if nobody was around to protect Madame, and the soldiers catch you, I could not bear and think of the consequences. Even in the netherworld, I would be saddened beyond my own imagination. Seeing how honest and sincere he looked, Bao Xi Ruo nodded. Yan Lia continued, I have thought this over thoroughly. The most important thing right now is to give your husband a proper burial. So we are going to Jia Xing. Then I can take out some money and get someone to take care of it at Lin An. If Madame has to do it by herself, then let me settle you down in Jia Xing and take the risk by myself. Bao Xi Ruo felt she was asking a bit too much. 
to ask him to take such a big risk for her, and replied, If Mr. can find someone reliable to take care of the whole matter, then that would be for the best. She continued, My husband had a sworn brother with the surname of Guo. He died with my husband. I am sorry to trouble you by asking you to try to give him a proper burial. As well, I... I... She started crying. Yan Lie replied, It's no trouble at all. Just leave it all to me. As for revenge, that bastard Duan Tian De is a government official, so killing him is not easy. Besides, he is extra careful right now. All we can do is patiently wait for our chance. Bao Xiro only wanted to kill him to avenge her husband, and then follow him into the netherworld. Even though Yan Lie's every word was true, she didn't know how long she would have to wait for this to happen. In a moment of impatience, she started to sob loudly. In between sobs, she replied, I, I really don't know about revenge. Even a hero like my husband could not defeat him. I, I'm just a weak woman. What, what can I do? Just let me die and join my husband, and that'll be that. Feeling that the situation was truly difficult, Yan Lia thought for a long while before finally saying, Madam, do you trust me? Bao Xiro nodded. Yan Lia continued, I'm the only thing, uh, the only thing we can do now is to head up north to avoid the soldiers. The Song officials can't chase us if we are up north, so as soon as we cross the Yang Si, we should be out of danger. We'll wait until things have cooled down before returning down south and avenging your husband. Madam, please rest assured, I will take care of this whole matter of justice for your husband. <clears throat> so you guys think he's a, he's a prince? All right, all right, let's see. Bao Xi Ruo hesitated. <clears throat> I am homeless, without any relatives in the world. If I don't follow him, where can a woman like myself settle down in this world? The faces of the soldiers that night were beastly. If I had fallen into their hands, I would definitely have suffered a fate worse than death itself. Yet, this man is not a friend nor a relative. Should a widow like me be traveling together with a young man like him? If I tried to kill myself now, he would without a doubt stop me. She felt lost. The only thing she was sure of was that the future would be difficult. Thinking forward and looking back like this, she felt as if her intestines were being twisted. For several days straight, now she had, she had shed tears, and now it seemed as if she had run out of tears to shed. Yanlia spoke up. If Madam feels that any part of my plan is bad, then please tell me. There is nothing I wouldn't do for you. Seeing how accommodating he was, Bao Xi Ruo actually felt a little bad about hesitating. Other than committing suicide, she really could not find another way out. Having no other choice, she lowered her head and replied, Why don't you take care of it? Yan Lia could not be happier. I will forever be grateful that Madam saved my life. Madam... Bao Xi Ruo interrupted him. You don't have to mention that matter ever again. Yan Lia replied, Yes, yes, of course. That night, the two of them stopped at an inn in the town of Xia Xi, still only getting one room. Ever since Bao Xi Ruo agreed to go up north with him, Yan Lia's actions had not been as gentlemanly and proper as before. For once in a while, his excitement would get out of hand. Bao Xi Ruo felt an indistinct notion that something might not be appropriate. But seeing that he had not shown even the slightest trace of getting any ideas, she figured that he must be a little too excited about being able to fully show his gratitude. Uh-huh, is that what he's excited about? The two of them reached Jie Xin at noon the next day. Jie Xin 
was a big city in the western parts of Zhejiang. Since this was the place where many trade routes come together, it had always been a very prosperous place. When the Song Dynasty moved south, Jiaxin had also become much closer to the capital, thus becoming even more prosperous and bustling. Yan Lia suggested, Let's find an inn and rest up for a bit. Bao Xiro was worried about soldiers fighting them and, and said, It's still early, we can still cover some ground. Yan Lia replied, The stores here aren't half bad. Madam's clothing is old and worn. Have to buy some new ones. This surprised Bao Xi Ruo as she took a moment to recover and replied, Didn't you just buy this yesterday? How is it already old and worn? Yan Lia answered. Yan Lia answered, There were a lot of dust on the way. After wearing the same clothes for a couple of days, it is no longer colorful anymore. Besides, as beautiful as Madam is, how can Madam possibly not wear the best clothing in the world? <laughs> Definitely some kind of royalty. Hearing him praising her beauty, Bao Xi Ruo was secretly happy inside, but she lowered her head and said, I am in the middle of paying my respects. Yan Lia immediately cut her off. Oh, yes, of course, I understand. Bao Xi Ruo did not say anything more. Her husband had never praised her beauty to her face like this before. She peeked over at Yan Lia and only saw sincerity on his face. <coughs> At once her heart shook, but she couldn't figure out if it was from happiness or sadness. Yan Lia asked around and went to the biggest hotel around, Elegant Waters Hotel. After washing up, Yan Lia and Bao Xi Ruo ate some snacks together, sitting across from each other. Bao Xi Ruo wanted to ask him for a separate room, but didn't know how to word it. Her face changed colors several times, for this was a heavy burden on her heart. After a bit, Yan Lia spoke up. Madam, please make yourself at home. I'm going out to buy some things and coming back, coming right back afterwards. Bao Xi Ruo nodded. Please don't spend too much money. Yan Lia smiled and replied. Pity that Madam is wearing mourning apparel and can't wear any jewelry. Even if I want to spend too much, I can't. Shocking events in the blizzard. Original translation by Moin Leon. Wait, what? Did it start all over again? Day in and day out, day after day. Wait. Yeah, exactly. The Jiantung River majestically. Okay. <laughs> they just doubled up. <laughs> oh, it's not as long as we thought, chapter one. Even if I want to spend too much, I can't. The time loop? What if there is a time loop? Okay. Well, that was chapter one. All right. I guess we'll go to chapter two. All right, chapter two, The Seven Freaks of Jiang Nan. We are continuing. We're not stopping there, that was too short. Just as Yan Lia walked out of the door, he saw a middle-aged scholar walking his way in the hallway, dragging his feet and yawning constantly. 
He was sort of smiling, but not really, and kept on giving him curious looks, all the while looking very relaxed and lazy. He was covered with dirt and oil, and his clothing was a mess. He obviously hadn't taken a bath in a long time. He had an old, broken black oil paper fan in hand that he was fanning himself with as he was walking. Seeing such a, an obviously refined scholar looking so dirty, Yan Lia frowned and picked up his pace in fear of getting some dirt on himself. Suddenly, the scholar began laughing dryly, a laugh that was very harsh on the ear. As he was walking by him, he casually reached out with his fan and patted Yan Lia on the shoulder. Even though Yan Lia knew martial arts, he was not able to get out of the way in time. This set him off, and he shouted, What do you think you're doing? <clears throat> the scholar laughed dryly again as he kept on walking, dragging his feet all through the hallway. He approached the manager and said, <clears throat> Hey, fellow. Even though I look really rough, I have lots of money. <clears throat> you have to watch out for some people, though. They trick people with their nice and refined looks. They put up a show for everyone. Seducing women, eat free food, live in inns for free. You know the type, so be on the lookout for them. To be safe, make them pay the bill beforehand. He didn't wait for the manager to respond before walking off, still dragging his feet. Yan Lia got even angrier, knowing that the whole conversation was, was aimed at him. After that little comment from the scholar, the manager turned his eyes towards Yan Lia. He now couldn't help but feel a little suspicious. Walking up to Yan Lia, he yawned a little, smiled, and said, Whoa, oh, no, no. Sir, please don't mind too much. It's not that I want to be impolite. Yan Lia knew what he meant as he humphed and replied, hm, Put this money in the drawer. He put his hand into his shirt to take the money out and was shocked. There had been at least 40 or 50 tails of silver in his shirt, but now that he was reaching for it, there was nothing there. Ooh, pickpocketed. So smooth. The manager saw the expression on his face and actually thought that the scholar's words were true. Immediately his expression became less polite as he thrust his chest out and asked, What? No money? Yan Lia replied, Wait here, I'm going to get some right now. He thought that he had forgotten his money because he was in a hurry to leave. As it turned out, when he went back to the room and looked into the bag that he had with him, even the tails of gold he had were gone as well. Nice. As to where his money went, he had no idea at all. He thought, Just a bit ago, Madame Bao and I both went to the water closet, but that only took several minutes or so. How could anyone have entered and messed around with the room? The thieves here in Jia Xing are really getting good. The manager stuck his head in through the door and looked around. Seeing that he did not have any money, he got angry. Is this woman your wife? If you're doing something indecent, then don't come here because it'll bring us trouble as well. Bao Xi Ruo was thoroughly embarrassed, and her face turned burning red. Yan Lia took one quick step towards the door and swung his arm, slapping the manager so hard that his face was covered with blood and he lost several teeth. The manager had his face in his hands as he began to scream. Uh, uh, I see! First you don't pay, now you want to fight! Yan Lia added a kick to his behind, and the manager went tumbling out of the room. Shocked, Bao Xi Ruo suggested, Let's get out of here, we can't stay here any longer. Yan Lia smiled, Don't worry. If we don't have any money, then we'll just ask them for some. He grabbed a chair and sat down by the door. Not long afterwards, the manager came back with twelve or so men, each with a club or a stick in hand, as they charged into the room. Yan Lia let out a big laugh and shouted, ha! <laughs> so you men want to fight? 
He suddenly jumped forward and confidently grabbed a stick from one of the men, faking left and hitting right. In a blink of an eye, he had already knocked four or five men down. The ruffians usually got by... These ruffians usually got on by using intimidation and bullying the weak, but seeing that their opponent was actually a match for them, they immediately threw down their weapons and scrambled out of the room. Those who were on the floor were crawling and rolling with all their might in fear of being left behind and hit again. <laughs> One slap man? True. Bao Shiro, who had been frightened a long time ago, said in a shaky voice, Things are getting out of hand, and the authorities might catch wind of this. Yan Lia smiled and replied, I want the authorities to show up. Bao Shiro could not figure out his plan, so she decided to stay quiet and see what happened. In less than an hour's time, a ruckus occurred outside as ten or so government officials came bursting in with iron sabers in hand. The rings on the sabers were banging against each other, making all kinds of noise. They shouted above the cacophony, Not only kidnapping, but assault as well? How dare he? Where is the scoundrel? Yan Lia sat there motionless in the chair. Seeing his fancy clothing and his proud arrogance, the officials didn't really dare to charge up to him. The leader of the group shouted, Hey, what's your name? What are you doing here in Jia Xing? Yan Lia shouted back, Go get Gai Yun Tong. Gai Yun Tong was the governor of the prefecture of Jia Xing. Hearing that he dared to speak their superior's name directly, the government officials were both shocked and furious. The leader shouted, Are you crazy? How dare you shout the honorable prefect guy's name in public? Yan Lia took out an envelope from inside his shirt and put it down on the table. He looked up at the ceiling and said, Take this to Gai Yun Tong and see if he comes or not. Psyduck, he asked for the manager. Truth. The leader took the envelope, seeing the words on it. He took a step back in shock, unsure if it was real or not. He whispered to the other men, oh, Look after him. Don't let him get away. Then he went flying off. Bao Xi Ro just sat there in the room nervously, not knowing what would happen next. Soon, another ten or so government men came running in. Along with them came two men wearing official uniforms that scrambled in front of Yan Lia and knelt while saying, yeah, they knelt. Humble Prefect Gai Yun Tong of the city of Jia Xing and District Magistrate Jiang Wen of the district of Xi Shui are honored to meet your excellency. Your humble servant did not know that your excellency had arrived, so please forgive us. For not welcoming you properly. Yan Lia waved his hand a little and shifted his weight slightly. I lost a little bit of money in this county and would like to request that you two brilliant judges investigate the matter. Gai Yun Tong immediately nodded. Yes, of course. Then he waved his hands. Wait, he waved his arm. One of their followers came walking up with a plate in each of their hands. One of them was glowing yellow because of the gold yuan bao ingot, the boat-shaped ingot on it. The other one, needless to say, had silver yuan bao on it. Uh, the ingots look like this. Yuan bao. Yeah, these things. Gai Yun Tong spoke up. To think that there are such brazen thieves in my jurisdiction, it is my fault as well. I hope your excellency will accept this as a slight compensation. Yan Lia smiled and nodded. 
Yan Yun, Gai Yun Tong reverentially held up the envelope and said, Your humble servant has just cleaned up my humble dwelling and would be honored if your excellency and madam would move there. Yan Lia replied, This place is suitable. I enjoy the peace and the quiet. His face suddenly darkened. Don't come around disturbing us any more. Gai Yun Song immediately nodded and said, Yes, yes, of course. If your excellency still needs anything, then please do not hesitate to ask your humble servant. Yan Lia did not reply. He only shook his head and waved his arm repeatedly. The two men quickly led the other men away. The manager was scared out of his wits as the owner of the place dragged him into the room. <laughs> The owner kneeled down and kowtowed, asking for mercy for them both. He said that as long as they are left alive, they would be willing to accept whatever other punishment might come their way. Yan Lia took out a silver yuan bao from the plate, threw it on the floor, and said, smiling, Take it. It's a reward. Now get out of my sight. The manager couldn't quite believe it all. But the owner saw that Yan Lie had no ill will in his expression, so he immediately picked up the silver yuan bao, kowtowed a couple of times, and dragged the manager out of sight in fear that Yan Lie might change his mind. Bao Xi Ruo could not quite believe what she had just seen. What kind of magic does that envelope hold? How come the authorities were frightened out of their wits when they saw its, con its contents? Yan Lia smiled. I actually have no power over them, really, but these officials are hopeless. Zhao Kuo only has this kind of people serving him. If he doesn't lose this country, then there is no justice in the world. Bao Xi Ruo asked, Zhao Kuo? Who is that? Yan Lia casually replied, The present Song Emperor, Ning Zhong. Shocked, Bao Xi Ruo immediately admonished, Quiet! How can you say his majesty's name out loud like that? Seeing that she cared about his safety, Yan Lia was ecstatic, smiling. He said, It's no big deal if I say it out loud. Up north, what would we call him if we don't call him Zhao Kuo? Bao Xi Ru was confused. Up north? Oh, where do you think he's from? Yan Lia nodded and was about to explain when hurried hoofbeats suddenly came from outside as ten or so riders came and stopped in front of the inn. Some color had just returned to Bao Xi Ruo's white face, but upon hearing the hoofbeats, the events of that night all came back to her. This made her face turn white as a sheet again. Yan Lia was frowning, looking as if he wasn't very pleased. Then came the sound of boots as well as several ugh. Then came the sound of boots as several soldiers in fine clothing came walking in. Upon seeing Yan Lie, the faces immediately broke out in smiles as they simultaneously shouted, Your Majesty! Bum 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 That's who he is. All of them kneeled down and saluted. Yan Lie smiled. So, you're finally here. Hearing that they called Yan Lie your majesty, Bao Xi Ruo was both surprised and puzzled. As those men got up off the floor, she noticed that they were all very strong and well built. Yan Lie waved his arm and said, Go wait outside. The soldiers answered and quickly left. Yan Lie turned to Bao Xi Ruo. How do you think my men compare with those Song soldiers? Bao Xi Ruo was even more surprised. They are not Song soldiers? Yan Lie smiled. I guess I have to be honest now. They are all great jinns, elite soldiers. He could not help but laugh out of pride. <laughs> Bao Xi Ruo suddenly realized that you, you are... Yan Lia smiled and answered, To tell Madam the truth, my surname needs one more word. Wan, and my given name also has one more word, Hong. Wan Yan Hong Lia. 
the sixth prince of great Jin, entitled the Prince of Chao, at your service. <laughs> You're all shook and blown. Chat. Ever since she was small, Bao Xiro had heard from her father the devious ways that the Jin used to take the land of her great song, the shame caused by the capture of the two emperors, and the cruelty with which the Jin torture and treat the Han peasants up north. It was the same after she married Yang Tie Xin, who hated the Jin even more. To find out that the person that she had spent all this time with these last couple of days was actually a prince of the jinn, she was left speechless. Seeing the expression on her face change, Wan Yan Honglia smiled and continued, I have always been fascinated by the South. Last year I asked my father to let me travel down to Linen as the goodwill ambassador for the New Year celebrations. Besides, the Emperor of Song still owed a couple of hundred of a couple hundred thousand tails of silver in annual tribute, so father wanted me to collect that on my trip as well. Damn, several hundred thousand tails of silver in tribute. The Emperor of Song has to give them every year. Bao Xi Ruo interrupted. Annual tribute? Wan Yan Honglia replied, Yes, the Song emperors, in order to convince us not to invade, pay us tribute every year in silk and silver. But they always complain that not enough revenue was generated to, through taxes, though they never gave us the tribute on time. This time I didn't leave any room for Han To Zhou to fall back on. I told him that if he didn't get all the money together within the month, I would personally lead an army down to collect it ourselves. Then he wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Bao Xi Ruo interrupted again. What did Chancellor Han say? Wan Yan Honglia proudly replied, What can he say? By the time I left Linan, the silk and silver were all north of the river. <laughs> Seeing Bao Xi Ruo was looking downwards and not responding, he went on, Actually, this tribute stuff didn't really need me. Any emissary could have done the job. What I really wanted was to see the South, to experience its beauty, and to meet its people for myself. Who knew that I would meet Madam? I dare not hope for such good fortune. Bao Xi Ruo was at a loss as to what to make of the situation, and still did not reply. Wan Yan Honglia offered, I'm off to buy some clothes for Madam now. Bao Xi Ruo replied with her head down, No need. Wan Yan Honglia smiled and said, the traveling money Chancellor Han gave me under the table wouldn't be gone if I bought a new set of clothes for Madam every day for a thousand years. Madam, don't worry. My soldiers are stationed all around this place. Nobody would dare to trouble you. Now she really is going to off herself. Yeah. All right, Sal. Have a good night. Thanks for joining. After he finished, he walked off. Bao Xi Ruo thought about all that happened, all that had happened since she met him. A royal prince like him, treating her as politely as he does. What does he plan to do? Then her thoughts drifted to her husband's love and caring for her, and yet he was killed and left her here all alone. She really didn't know what she should do or could do. In desperation, sadness, and confusion, all she could do was clutch her pillow and cry her heart out. Wan Yan Honglia, having put the gold and silver into his shirt, walked out onto the street. Seeing the friendly attitude of the place and the people, even though most of them were peasants, there were still many refined and educated people. 
he could not help but be impressed. Suddenly, hurried hoofbeats came from ahead of him as a horse galloped through the streets towards him. This street wasn't very wide to begin with, and now it was filled with people and merchants. Added to that, people had sent up small vendor booths. Wait, had set up small vendor booths on both sides of the street. How could a horse gallop through it? Wan Yan Honglia immediately dodged to the side of the street, and in the blink of an eye, a yellow horse came bursting through the crowd of people. This was no ordinary horse. It was tall and fit with muscles rippling throughout its body. Obviously, it was a very rare thoroughbred. Wan Yan Honglia was admiring the horse, and when he looked up at the rider, he was surprised yet again. Such a beautiful horse! But its rider was a sorry-looking fellow who was both short and fat. He looked like a giant slab of meat riding on that horse. This person's arms and legs were amazingly short. He did not have a neck. Yet his head was extraordinarily big, as if his neck was sucked into his shoulders. It seemed rather odd that horse was galloping through the crowd of people at full speed. Yet it did not run into a single person or knock over a single object. Its hooves landed on the ground softly and nimbly, jumping over pottery, sidestepping vegetables. It seemed to be flashing through some non-existent gaps in the crowd, as though this crowded street was a wide-open plain. Wan Yan Honglia could no longer contain himself and shouted out loud, Excellent! Alright, I think it's a good time for a break. I will be right back. Five minutes. And we're back. Lady Koi, is she showing? Okay, is she showing? Um, so when the Taoist priests... Um, when the Taoist priests uh, checked her pulse or whatever and realized that she was pregnant, that was about three months ago, I think. Right? Like three months have passed. So assuming that, I don't know, maybe she was pregnant for a couple of weeks at that time, then she should be kind of showing now, right? Should be starting to show. Hearing the praise, that short, chubby fellow turned his head and glanced at him. Wen Yan Honglia noticed that his entire face was covered with red spots caused by drinking too much wine. Does your face have spots by drinking too much wine? Isn't it just all red? His <clears throat> big and round as well as equally red wine nose, looked as if there was a red tomato stuck on his face. He thought to himself, Such an excellent horse. I have to give it, no matter... Well, I have to have it, no matter the price. At this moment, two kids playing tag ran onto the street just in front of the horse. They came out of nowhere and gave the horse quite a scare, as it had no room to get out of the way. The horse's left foot was just about to land on one of the kids when the rider lifted up the reins and jumped off of the saddle. Suddenly becoming lighter, the horse's stride became higher and longer, easily flying over the kid's head. That rider then softly and gently landed back onto the saddle. Oh, damn. That's how your grandpa looked? The spots? Okay, but this guy is not, um, this guy is not old, right? It seems. He shouldn't have liver spots. Shocked, Wen Yan Honglia immediately decided that even though there were a great number of skilled riders among the Jin, none were a match for this man. If he could get this man to go back with him to train the cavalry, then his cavalry would be almost invincible. This was something much more important to him than a great horse. On this trip south, he made mental notes on where an army could be stationed and where rivers could be crossed. 
He even asked around uh, about the skills and names of every administrator in the counties he crossed. Seeing the amazing skill of this short fellow, he couldn't believe how stupid the Song authorities were for letting a talent like this go to waste. He decided then and there that he was going to somehow convince this man to go back to Yanjing with him. Having made the decision, he immediately started running after them, fearing that, with the horse's speed, he would lose him. He was just about to shout at them when he saw the horse had run to the corner of the street and stopped. This was quite unexpected, as he figured that, with the speed that the horse was running, he would have to slowly come to a stop. Yet this horse was able to stop instantly. This is something he had never seen before. Even some great martial arts practitioners wouldn't be able to come to a complete stop when they were exerting themselves like this. The short, fat fellow jumped off the horse and charged into a building. When Yan Honglia hurried to the front of the building, inside the building was erected a large wooden sign, handed down from Venus. It was a two-storied restaurant. Looking up, a huge sign hanging from the roof had the words Pavilion of the Drunken Immortal written on it. The calligraphy was very elegant. On the side was written in smaller characters by resident Dong Po. It turned out that the words were written by Su Dong Po, one of the greatest scholars of the Song Dynasty, as well as all of Chinese history. Seeing the grandeur of this restaurant, Wan Yan Honglie thought, Since he is here, then I might as well invite him to a great big meal. That way I can become great friends with him, and everything after that would be simple. All of a sudden, that fellow came running down from upstairs to the horse's side with a wine jug in hand. Wan Yan Honglie immediately got out of the way. Now that he was standing on the ground, the fellow looked even more out of proportion. He wasn't over 1.5 meters by foot high. Yet he was almost 1.5 meters wide as well. The horse was very tall in stature because of its long legs, and the man's head was barely as high as the stirrup from the saddle. He placed the wine jug in front of the horse, gently hit the jug a couple of times, and then casually picked the top half of the jug off turning the jug into a gigantic bowl of wine. The horse reared up on its hind legs and let out a loud neigh before coming back down and drinking from the bowl. From the sweet smell in the air, Wen Yan Honglia could tell that the wine was actually the famed wine, the famed wine Blushing Daughter from Xiaoqing County in Zhejiang Province. From the fragrance, it had been left aging for, most, for more than ten years. The short, fat fellow walked back into the restaurant and tossed a huge silver ingot into the owner's desk. Prepare three tables of the best food. Two of them can have meat and wine. The other one can't. The owner smiled and replied, Right away, Mr. Han. We just received four Sai Lu fish from the Song River. They are the best when served with wine. Please take the money back, Mr. Han. We'll sort all that out later. The short, chubby fellow rolled his eyes and shouted, What's the matter? Eating and drinking are free? Do you think I'm broke and just beg off of other people? Still with a smile on his face, the owner argued no further as he turned and shouted, Men, prepare some really good stuff for Mr. Han. The cooks and waiters around the place answered and went about their jobs. Wen Yan Honglie was taking all this in. Although he's dressed plainly, he spends money like a wealthy man. Judging from how everyone is treating him with such manners, he's probably a powerful man in Jiaxing. It would seem that convincing him to go up north with me to teach horse riding is going to be quite difficult. Let's see who people are. Let's see. Wait. Let's see who the people are that he is inviting to lunch before going any further. So he went into the restaurant, sat down at a table by the window, and ordered a couple of small dishes along with a bottle of wine. 
The pavilion of the drunken immortal was situated on the shores of the south lake. The lake surface was covered by a light fog, and several small boats were slowly making their way around the lake. Green and smooth-looking water caltrop leaves cover about half of the lake. Seeing such a sight, he immediately felt relaxed and at peace. Jiaxing was a famous city in the, of, the state, of the ancient state of Yue. The plums grown here were sweet and delicious, like the best wines. During the spring and autumn period, this place was called Zui Li, meaning drunken plums. It was also here that the famed king of Yue, Guo Jian, had thoroughly re- defeated the famed king of Wu, He Lu. This place was the point at which travelers and merchants from the two states came together. The South Lake was famous for another thing, the green cow- water caltrops grown in it. Not only are the fruit of the caltrops sweet and smooth, they were also crunchy and refreshing, deservedly proclaimed as the best in the world. This resulted in a lot of caltrops being grown in the lake. It was right in the middle of spring. The lake was clean and the leaves were green, as if someone had covered a a sheet of jade glass with small pieces of jadeite. Wen Yan Honglie was just enjoying the scene when he suddenly noticed a single boat come flying into view. This boat was unusually narrow in width, and the the bow of the boat was extraordinarily high. Along the sides of the boat, there were two rows of waterfowl. At first, he didn't pay much attention to it, but in the blink of an eye, the boat had overtaken another boat that was far ahead of it. The speed at which the boat was going was astounding. As soon as it got closer, Wen Yan Honglie saw that there was a person sitting in the middle of the boat. Another person wearing a straw cape sat in the back steering the boat. Surprisingly, it was a girl. She had only to lightly flick the oar in the water, and the boat would shoot forward like an arrow. That one flick had to be at least powerful enough to move a 100 jin object. It was odd enough that a girl would be so strong, but how could she exert such a force through the wooden oar? A few more strokes and the boat neared the pavilion. The sun shone down onto the oar, which appeared to be made of copper. The girl tied the boat to one of the wooden posts beside the stone staircase next to the pavilion and nimbly jumped ashore. The man sitting in the middle of the boat put a pole with a load of firewood on each end onto his shoulders and followed her ashore. The two of them walked up into the pavilion. The girl shouted happily at the chubby fellow, Third brother! She proceeded to sit down next to him. The fat man greeted the two people. Fourth brother! Little sister! You two showed up early! When Wen Yan Honglie sized the two newcomers up, he noticed that the girl was about 17 or 18 years of age, with a slender body, big eyes, long eyelashes, and snow-white skin. She was obviously a local girl from the south of the Yangtze. She had the copper oar in her left hand and took off her straw hat with her right, revealing a head of soft, shining black hair. Wen Yan Honglie mused, Although this girl isn't as beautiful as Madame Bao, she is still very attractive in another way. Is he going to fall in love with her too? Hmm, let's see. The man carrying the firewood was also about, was about 30 or so. His clothing was green-colored with a belt made of straw around his waist and straw sandals on his feet. His hands and feet were huge and his face appeared without emotion. He put down the two loads of wood and rested his carrying pole against the table. The table was pushed several centimeters down by the weight of the pole. Shocked, Wen Yan Honglie inspected the pole closely, but there seemed nothing out of the ordinary with it. It was black and smooth all over, with a slight curve in the middle and two little caps on either end. For this pole to be that heavy, It had to be made of iron or some other kind of heavy metal. A wooden axe hung from the man's waist, and there were some noticeable dents on the blade of the axe. The two of them had just sat down when the sound of footsteps came from the stairs as two more men came walking up. The girl shouted, 
Fifth brother, sixth brother, did you two come together? The first man was big and tall, at least 130 or 140 kilograms, which is around 285 to 308 pounds. He wore an apron around his waist. His body was naturally oily, and the top of his shirt was open, revealing some of what must be a chest full of hair. His sleeves were all rolled up as well, and his arms were covered with black hair that was several centimeters long, and hanging from his waist was a foot-long knife. From his appearance, he was a butcher. The one behind him was unusually short, with a small felt hat on his head, and a small scale and bamboo basket in his hands. He looked just like a street vendor. Wen Yan Honglia could not help but wonder. These three people obviously know martial arts, yet they call these two average city dwellers brothers. Suddenly, there came a constant clunking outside on the street, like that made from metal hitting stone. The clunking slowly came up the staircase, and a blind man dressed in ragged clothing followed. He looked about forty years of age. His lips were thin and his cheekbones prominent. His face looked gray and seemed full of hate and anger. The five people sitting at the table all stood up and, ch and greeted. Big brother! The girl lightly knocked on the seat of one of the chairs. Big brother, you sit here. The blind man replied. All right, is second brother here yet? The man that looked like a butcher replied. Second brother has arrived in Jiaxing, so he should be here any time soon. The girl laughed. Speak of the devil. The sound of someone dragging his feet as he walked came from the staircase. Before Wen Yan Honglia figured it all out, up the stairs appeared a dirty, torn fan, which was flicked a couple of times, and only then did a poor, lackadaisical scholar come walking up. Nah, the very one that he had met earlier in the inn. A thought popped in Wen Yan Honglia's mind. He must have been the one that took my money. Just as his anger was rising, the man shot a smile at him and then stuck out his tongue and made a face. <laughs> Only then did he turn to the others and greet them. It seemed that he was second among them. Wen Yan Honglia speculated. Looks like every one of them is a martial arts master. If I can somehow take them under my wing, they would be an enormous amount of help for our endeavors. You feel like these people are not going to be pro Jin? <laughs> yeah, probably not. As for the small matter of the poor scholar taking my money, that could easily be forgiven. It would be best to see what's going on first. The poor and pedantic scholar downed a cup of wine, then proceeded, still shaking his head from side to side, to loudly orate. Dishonorable riches, let it go. The Jade Emperor will get mad. As he was reciting these lines, he reached into his shirt and took out one gold or silver yuan bao after another and neatly lined them up on the table. In total, there were eight, eight, silver, wait, eight of silver and two of gold. From these Yuan Baozi's color and shape, Wen Yan Honglia knew that these were his, but he did not get mad. On the contrary, this piqued his interest even more. Entering my room and stealing the money wasn't hard, but he only tapped my shoulder one time with his fan, yet... He was able to steal all the money that was inside my shirt without me noticing. That magical hand skill of his, indeed, is something rarely seen in this world. From the actions of these six men and a woman, it seemed like they were doing the inviting and had invited two tables of men here for a drink. Because the guests hadn't arrived yet, the seven of them were only drinking some light wine and the dishes hadn't been brought out either. On the other two tables was only one pair of chopsticks each. That meant that there were only two guests. Wen Yan Honglia mused. These seven freaks are waiting for guests. I wonder what kind of weird guests they'll have. 
After waiting for about the time it would take to boil a pot of water, a voice came up from downstairs. Amitofo. The blind man spoke up. The venerable monk Jiao Mu is here. He stood up. The other six freaks followed him as they all stood up in preparation to welcome the guest. Amitofo. The voice said again as a monk that looked very, every bit like a burnt piece of wood came walking up the stairs. <laughs> what does that mean? He's like very old um, and dark and very wrinkly, I guess. This monk was about 40 or so. He was we well, can't be that wrinkly. He was wearing a yellow monk's robe, and in his hand was a piece of wood with one end burnt black. It's unclear what it was used for. It was unclear what it was used for. After the monk and the seven of them went through the formal greetings, you would think ashen skinned? Okay. The poor scholar led him to one of the empty tables, and all of them sat down. The monk rose slightly out of his seat in respect and said, When that person came all the way to our gates, I knew that I was no match for him. Now that the seven heroes of the South are willing to lend a hand, I could not be any more grateful. The blind man replied, Venerable monk Jiao Mu, you do not need to be so polite. We seven brothers and sister have all been dependent upon the monk's hospitality now. And then, now that monk Jiao Mu is in trouble, how could we not get involved? Besides, that man came and, relying entirely upon his martial arts skills, made trouble for the monk for no reason. It is clear that he thinks nothing of us here in the martial world from this area. Even if the venerable monk did not ask us, we would have come and had we found out about... He hadn't finished what he was going to say when the stairs started groaning as if they were going to collapse. It was like a huge, heavy beast, like an elephant, or at least a huge water buffalo, was walking up the stairs. The owner of the place and the waiters were all screaming downstairs. Ay, you idiot! You can't take that up there! The stairs are going to collapse! Quick, quick, stop him! Get him back down here! But the sound of wood bending got louder and louder. Crack! One of the wooden stair treads snapped. Soon two more snapped as well. For a moment, Wen Yan Honglia wasn't sure he believed what he was seeing. A Taoist priest came walking up the stairs with a huge copper vat in his hands. After taking another look, he was frightened out of his wits. The Taoist priest was the Cheng Chun Zi elder Chu Chu Chi. Ah, he's back. He's on a huge copper vat. Wen Yan Honglia's mission as emissary to the Song Imperial Court was to coerce some of the officials of the Song Court so that when they eventually invade the South, there would be agents lending a hand from the inside. The Song emissary, Wang Dao Qian, who accompanied him down from Yan Jing, was greedy and corrupt. He had already secretly sworn allegiance to the Jin dynasty. When he, they arrived at Linan, he was the one that did the legwork for Wan Yan Hong Lia, but unexpectedly he was killed suddenly by a Taoist priest. Even his head, heart, and liver was gone. Shocked and in fear that someone had found out about his plan, Wen Yan Hong Lia decided to lead his bodyguards and, with the best city guards of Lin An leading the way, personally chased down the assassin. When they chased him to Ox village, they caught up with Chiu Chiu Chi. Unexpectedly, this Taoist priest was a martial arts master. Wen Yan Honglia hadn't even made a move before he was pierced through the shoulder by an arrow that Chiu Chiu Chi threw back. The men that came with him were all killed. If Wen Yan Honglia had not quietly crawled away during the confusion of the battle, 
and was then rescued and treated by Bao Xi Ruo, the dignified and honorable royal prince of the Jin dynasty would have died there in a farm village without even really knowing how he had been killed. Ren Yan Honglie forced himself to calm down and noticed that Chu Chu Chi glanced at his face for a moment before moving his attention entirely onto the monk Jiao Mu and the group, and the group of seven. Obviously, he had not recognized him. Figuring that this was because he had been injured as soon as he showed up that night, so Chiu Chu Chi was not able to see his face clearly. Only then did he feel a little bit better. <clears throat> but when his eyes moved back to the copper vat, he was shocked again, so much so that he almost jumped out of his chair. This kind of vat was common in temples and shrines and was commonly used for burning papers, incense, and fake money for the dead. It was more than a meter across and was probably around 400 jins, or 400 pounds or so. From the vat came the sweet smell of wine. Obviously, it was filled with expensive wine, which without a doubt added a lot more weight to the vat. And these people love wine. But he did not seem to be using any strength in his arm at all. Every step he took, every move he made, the floorboards moaned and bent from the weight. Panic engulfed the bottom level as the owner, waiters, cooks, all the patrons, and everyone else scrambled out, fearing that the entire floor would collapse on top of them. Coldly, the monk Jiao Mu spoke up. I am honored that my Taoist brother would show himself here, but what's the point in bringing the paper-burning vat from our humble little temple? Let me introduce you to the seven heroes of the South. Oh, he took it from their temple, and he filled it with wine. That sounds like an insult, right? <laughs> Not cool. Chu Chu Chi made a respectful gesture with his left hand and said, This humble Taoist has just visited your holy temple, where I heard from the other monks that the venerable monk was inviting me for a drink at Pavilion of the Drunken Immortal. I figured that you would have an undoubtedly invited some other friends. It turns out I was right. I have long admired the seven heroes of the South. I am... Um, Fortunate today to make your acquaintance. <clears throat> Monk Jiao Mu turned to the seven people and said, This is Elder Chang Chun Zi, Chiu Chu Chi of the Chan Jin sect. I'm sure everyone has heard of him. Turning around to Chiu Chu Chi, he pointed at the blind man and continued, This is the head of the seven heroes. The hero Ku, flying bat soaring through the sky, Ku Jun U. He followed by introducing the others. All the while, Wen Yan Hong Lia giving his, this all of his attention and memorizing their names. Number two in rank was that poor and downtrodden looking scholar that stole his money, named Magic Hands Scholar, Ju Tong. <laughs> yeah, that fits. That fits him very well. The fat, short fellow that arrived first was horse god Han Bao Ju. He ranked third. The peasant that carried the load of firewood was number four. His name was Wood Chopper of the Southern Mountains, Nan Xi Ren. Ranked number five was that huge man that looked like a butcher, smiling Duda Chang Ash Chang A Sheng. The yellow fellow, wait, the sorry. The little fellow that looked like a merchant was surnamed Chan. Jin Fa was his, was his given name, and his nickname was Hidden Hero of the Bustling City. The fisher girl was called Yue Maiden Sword, Han Xiaoying, obviously the youngest of the seven heroes. <clears throat> All the while, the monk Jiao Mu was introducing everyone. Chiu Chu Chi would very respectfully bow a little as a sign of respect, but his right hand was still holding up the vet, and there was no sign of fatigue at all. 
A few of the braver ones of the people downstairs saw that there was no immediate danger, and actually walked back in to see what was going on. Ku Jian'e spoke up. People call us seven brothers and sister, the seven freaks, because we are a rather odd collection of characters. We dare not assume the name seven heroes that the monk Jiao Mu called us. All of us have long admired the famed seven masters of Chan Jin, especially the elder Chan Chun Zi, whose many chivalrous deeds we have all heard of. The monk Jiao Mu is a most warm and friendly man. We can't understand how he could have offended Elder Chu. If the elder thinks anything of us, then please let the seven of us be a mediator for the dispute. Besides, even though Taoism and Buddhism worship different types of deities, you two gentlemen are still both monks or priests and members of the martial world. Why don't we forgive and forget, so we can just gather here and have a nice little drink together? Chu Chu Chi replied, "I have never met the venerable monk Jiao Mu before." Nor is there any gratitude or grudges between the two of us. As long as he hands over two people, then I personally will immediately go to the Fa Hua Monastery to ask for forgiveness. Ku Jianu asked, "Which two people?" Chu Chu Qi replied, "I have two very good friends who were killed by corrupt officials working with the Jin. Their widows are all alone in the world." Hiroku, do you think that I should step into this matter? But when Yan Honglie heard this, the cup in his hand suddenly shook, and some wine spilled onto the table. Ku Jianu replied, "It wouldn't matter if they are widows of the monk's good friends, even if none of us have ever met them. If we knew about something like this happening, we would step in and do the best we can to take care of them. This is something that should be done without hesitation." Chu Chu Chi loudly replied, "That's right. I just want the monk Jiao Mu to hand no, those two widows over to me. He is a monk. How could he keep two widows in his monastery and not hand them over? The seven heroes here are reasonable and righteous people. Please do the right thing." Hmm. What's going on? When he finished saying this, not only were the monk Jiao Mu and the seven freaks shocked, Wen Yan Honglie was quite surprised as well. He thought, "Is he not talking about Madame Young and Madame Guo, but someone else?" The monk Jiao Mu's face was burnt yellowish to begin with. Now it was even more burnt looking. He could not bring himself to reply for a while, as he could only stammer, "You, you." Talking nonsense, Chu Chu Chi was furious. You are a man of the martial world too. How dare you do such a shameful deed? He pushed with his right hand, and the several hundred kilogram heavy vat with the wine in it flew. Wait, went flying towards the monk Jiao Mu. The monk immediately jumped aside. The people that gathered at the end of the stairs were frightened out of their wits, and all of them turned around and pushed their way down the stairs in a panic. Smiling Du Da, Zhang Asheng figured that although the vat was heavy, he would still be able to handle it with his strength. So he stepped up, channeled some inner strength into his arms, and waited until the vat arrived before he, with a shout, grabbed hold of it. The muscles on his back and his shoulders bulged out as he was able to control the vat all by himself. As he lifted the vat up over his head, the amount of force exerted under his feet was too great, and with one loud crack, his left foot went through the floorboards, causing the crowd downstairs to scream. Zhang Asheng took two steps forward, bent his arms slightly, and with the move, opening the windows to view the moon. He threw the vat back at Chu Chu Chi. Chu Chu Chi caught the vat with his right hand and laughed. Ma ha 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 ha! The seven freaks of the south are just like the rumors say, very deserving of their fame. Then his expression darkened as he turned to the monk Jiao Mu. What happened to those two widows? You are forcing two widows to live in your monastery. What for? 
If you dare to touch a single strand of their hair, I'll smash your bones until they are dust and burn down that monastery of yours. Zhu Tong flicked his fan and said while shaking his head, The monk Jiao Mu is an honorable and respected monk. How could he do such a shameful thing? Elder Chu must have heard from of this from someone shameless and despicable. This kind of gossip can't be trusted. Chu Chu Chi was still furious. I saw it with my own eyes. How could it be untrue? The seven freaks were surprised by this. The monk Jiao Mu finally spoke up. If you want to come here and make a name for yourself, here south of the Yangtze, that's fine. But you don't need to drag my name through the dirt. You, you, go out into Jiaxing and ask around. See how many people think I would do such a thing. Chu Chu Chi snickered. <laughs> All right, you've got helpers and want to win by sheer numbers. I am involved in this matter now, so there's no way you could get away from this. You are using the sacred ground of your deity to hide women, and that's bad already. But the women's husbands are the descendants of patriots, and they were murdered. Ku Jena spoke up. Elder Chu accused Monk Jiao Mu of hiding two women, but Monk Jiao Mu denies it. Why don't all of us go to the temple and see who's right and who's not? Although I am blind, my ears are still working fine. His six brothers and sister immediately agreed with him. Chiu Chiu Chi sneered. Search the temple? I have already searched it inside and out. But two women walked in and apparently disappeared. The only possibility is that he hid them. I will forget this if the monk hands them over. Zhu Kong. Chu Tong replied, now What if it turns out that those two women aren't women? Chiu Chiu Chi was confused. What? Chu Tong answered with a straight face. They are fairies and either know how to become invisible or become one with the earth. The other six freaks couldn't help but laugh at that remark. Chiu Chiu Chi was furious. Wow, so funny, guys. Chiu Chiu Chi was furious. So. Are you mocking me? All right, it seems like you people are talk taking the monk's side, true? Ku Jena righteously replied, Although our martial arts might be laughable in the eyes of a master from the Chanjin sect, we still have a bit of name here in the south of the Yangtze. Ask around, people will say, the seven freaks of the south, they may be crazy, but they are not cowards. We wouldn't dare bully others, but we can't let others bully us either. Chu Chu Chi replied, I have heard much about the good name of the seven heroes of the South. This matter does not concern you, so please do not get involved in this sticky matter. Let this monk and I settle it between us. Monk, follow me. I like how he says that. Monk, follow me. He reached out toward the monk Jiao Mu's wrist. Monk Jiao Mu dipped his wrist and dodged this move. Seeing that the two of them have started to fight, horse god Han Bao Ju shouted, Reverend Chu, why are you being so unreasonable? Wait, Reverend Chu, why are you being so unreasonable? Chu Chu Chi stepped back and asked, What do you mean? Han Bao Ju replied, We trust the monk Jiao Mu. If he says there aren't any women, then there really aren't any woman. Which man living in the martial world would lie? Wait, what, what is that? Which man living in the martial world would lie? What do you mean? Chu Chu Chi replied, If he isn't lying, then I, then am I causing him trouble for no reason whatsoever? I saw it with my own eyes. If I'm wrong, then I'll dig out these two eyeballs and give them to you. I am definitely going to see this to the end. It seems like the seven of you are definitely getting involved, right? 
The seven freaks answered simultaneously. Right. Choo Choo Chi replied, well, he's definitely wrong, right? Is he actually going to dig out his eyeballs? Choo Choo Chi replied, All right, I'll drink a toast of wine to all seven heroes. Let the fight get started after we are finished toasting. He dipped his right hand and lowered the vat to his mouth. After taking a good gulp, he shouted, If you please! With one flick of the hand, the vat went flying towards Zhang Asheng again. Zhang Asheng thought to himself, If I catch it over my head like I did last time, then it would be impossible for me to drink out of it, wouldn't it? So he took two steps back, held his hands in front of his chest, and waited for the vat. Once it arrived, he threw his arms to the side and let the vat hit him straight in the chest. He was born chubby, so his chest was covered with layers upon layers of fat and muscle, which acted like a cushion as the vat hit his chest. He immediately took a deep breath, flexed his chest muscles, brought his arms along the side of the vat, and caught it. He then lowered his head and took a huge gulp of wine. Excellent wine, he praised as he suddenly retracted his arms back to the front of his chest, and before the vat could fall onto the floor, executed the move mountain moving double palms, sending the vat flying backwards to Chiu Chiu Chi. This move was quick, powerful, and fast, obviously a move from a master of martial arts moves. Wen Yan Honglia was secretly shocked by what he had just witnessed. All right. I think we can stop there. That's pretty good. Looks like this chapter is not doubled like the chapter one. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to run into that problem again. <sighs> All right, guys. What do you think of that chapter? Seems pretty cool. These seven freaks are pretty interesting, I think. Hmm. <sighs> All right. Hold on. Oh, you think the two women are, one of them might be uh, the husband pretending to be her to protect, protect the other lady. Good point. All right. Cheers. That monk is terrifying. Was he? Baby formula time. <laughs> I'm not going to rob a baby of its food, okay? I think I'm just going to give that to another person. Okay. Good. I think the story is definitely getting started. Um, it's getting interesting. Okay. I think uh looks like this story has also has interesting characters like all of the other stories. Which makes it good. You feel bad for the repairman? Oh. True. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so we think that um that young Tia Xin did not die, right? And um and what was her name? Li Ping, the wife of uh Gao Guo Xiao Tian. Also did not die. Yeah, because they have to give birth first. Right? Because we we have that that um uh, the vow that if they're born both male and female, they would become sworn brothers or sisters. And if one is male and female, then they have to get married. So they would have to get born first. So they can't die yet. 
What kind of wine is that? Um, I've had it for the past couple of streams. It's sake with plum flavor, plum sake. It's pretty good. Very sweet. I would have liked it to be less sweet, but it's pretty good. <sighs> All right, guys. Um, yeah, story is pretty good. I'm looking forward to what happens next. Um, all right, guys. I love you, and I will see you next time. Bye.